This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Pat Mills. Let's see, you directed, you wrote, you starred, presumably produced 87 other jobs on Guidance. I didn't produce, but I did other things as well. You were, you were intricately involved, yeah. let's say. Um, Guidance is the story of an actor who needs to get some money to pay for rent and other stuff and uh, decides to act as a guidance counselor in a school um, without getting too much into the rest of it because it gets pretty interesting. Um, let's start with the just the basic. Um, what inspired you to make this project? I mean, you've had a sort of varied acting career over your um, history. You've directed some stuff. You've written some stuff. Um, what exactly made this really be the project you wanted to do now? Well, the thing is, I was writing another film. It was a teen movie called Don't Talk to Irene. And I found myself as the writer wanting to give the characters that had written advice. And so as I was writing it, I wanted to talk to them. So what I ended up doing was kind of, I created this other character based out of myself as the writer, giving advice to these teenagers that I was writing. That's pretty so, funny. Yeah, so I ended up, um, while I was writing this other script, I was writing these notes about this David Gold character that I had created as a guidance <laughs> counselor in my head. So kind of the story was born out of this character. That's very cool. Um, where exactly did the determination to, you know, take on so many tasks? Film is a very exhausting process. Directing it, writing it, all these things are very intense projects. I know you've had some acting in your background, but um, what made it, made you decide to make yourself like the lead role in this movie? It seems like it could have been very easy to be like, you know what, I've got enough shit going on, why don't we get someone else? Or was it just your connection from writing that other story and having that voice in your head that made you say like, I don't know if I can get anyone to embody this character the way it is in my head or something like that? Well, we tried to find somebody to play the character and we auditioned a lot of people. And what happened was I was doing some improv in the auditions with some of the younger, like the teen characters that would come into audition. And my producers um, kind of saw me interacting with them and wanted me to audition for the film. So that was a little awkward, auditioning for your own movie. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up getting the part and I'm, it was really scary because the first couple of days I thought I'd made a huge mistake, um, but I really got into it and I ended up having a really good time and, you know, directing your first feature is not easy, but in a certain way, being in the scene with actors, when I knew I wanted to do some improv with this film, mm -hmm. ended up being, like, the right thing to do because I was able to just be in the middle of a scene and think, hey, I want to do some improv now and then surprise the other actors in the scene. That's, that's an interesting question in that what is the challenge like? I mean, a lot of the people in the movie are pretty young actors, I would imagine. I don't know if they're this is like a first project or just a few projects, but like throwing at improv at somebody who's a relatively new actor, how difficult was that for them? Um, and I don't know, like what was that experience like and how off guard would they be caught during that process? Cause it seems like it, it, it could provide some very interesting results, but it seems like it'd be hard to know what you're going to get with such young actors. And we never did. And, but that's what I wanted. I wanted something a bit more authentic rather than, young people sticking to the script. And in my experiences as an actor when I was a kid, when you get too concerned about the words that you're supposed to speak, it just comes off as it. Oh, authentic. absolutely. It's a, it's a nightmare. Like, I, 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 I don't know if this is comparable, but I've had those times where, like, I need to say, like, you know, a one-minute thing, and you'll rehearse it in your mind so many times, and then it comes time to actually say it, and you just fuck it up time and time oh, and time again. Totally. Yeah. So... We shot with two cameras um, in a lot of the guidance office scenes, so I was able to go off script completely. <laughs> and sometimes we we do a long take for like seven minutes long wow. just to see what we could get. Um, and we got some little bits, and in the edit, we take bits from here and there and kind of make the scene out of some of it was scripted, some of it wasn't. Reactions were, were authentic when they were improv. So we would just take bits and pieces and we're able to do that because of the two cameras and not really be too concerned about continuity. So that was really great. You, you referenced sort of like uh, your child acting background. That is an element of the character in the movie. Um, how did that experience 
play a role in terms of you making that an aspect of the character in the movie? And how did that influence you in terms of the way you think about things like um, interacting with adults? Because obviously that's an important aspect of the movie, you know, how your character relates to these youths. How did, you know, being in a position of a child actor, that's, you know, in so many ways, there's so many cliches that are associated with that. How did that experience influence your impression about how youth should be interacted with as adults and how did it in, inspire, you know, your character's, I guess, gestation? Ooh, good question. Um, so in my experience as a child actor, you, there's something about, there's a fear about growing up because then mm. you're not going to get gigs. You're going to get phased out or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and that is what happens. When you're a child actor, you go through that awkward phase when you're a teenager, and then you start, you, your agent doesn't call you anymore, and then you don't get gigs. And so you kind of have this idea that adulthood is this thing that you should avoid. <laughs> and with the character of David, he's just this man-child. He wants to stay a teenager for the rest of his life, and that's why he really relates to teenagers. Like, he has not grown up. He's in his 30s, and he's still emotionally stuck in high school. And I can relate to that as well. And one thing that was happening while I was writing the script was Amanda Bynes was having her breakdown. Interesting. Um, and I couldn't help but be influenced by that. And I started to think about what happens to child actors and like Danny Pintaro and all these people from the 80s, and where are they now? Absolutely. And... What happens to a person when they think that they've creatively and professionally peaked when they were 13? So I was interested in that. And, you know, when you're a child actor, you get this money before you can learn about, like, managing your finances. So people who are child actors generally um, don't really know how to manage that. And they spend all their money and they think it's going to continue to come and then it doesn't. And then they're screwed. And then <laughs> David Gold, for example, doesn't know what else to do. He loves teenagers. He gets along with them. So he becomes a, he lies and becomes a high school guidance counselor. It's natural. I can totally understand yeah. it. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about the movie is it sort of touches upon a lot of really um, thoughtful concepts in terms of, you know, identity, sexuality, sexual orientation, all sorts of things that, I mean, I don't know, obviously you were ahead of the curve since this came out at TIFF, um, but has become a very important topic of discussion since Bruce Jenner really popularized it in the U.S. Um, what was it like in terms of your thought process of adding those elements and sort of fleshing out the character? I mean, it would have been very easy. And this is one of the things I actually enjoyed about the movie is watching the movie initially, my gut reaction was like, oh, you know, this is a screwed up teacher who's going to going to discover himself during the process of um, going through this right. process as an educator, which is like the traditional American comedy or whatever, but it doesn't go there, which is a very pleasant surprise. So what was the thought process in terms of creating this complex world and characters, not just David, but some of the other characters as well in, in this movie? In terms of the identity. I mean, just the... identity or identity, sexuality, gender, all those kind of things are, are issues that could have easily been like jettisoned and make a much more streamlined right. movie but it adds an interesting dimension to the characters and you care about them in different ways because of their um, unique well so I created so David was based out of my own um, so he's feel, he's so distanced himself from his sexuality and he's just not locking into his identity that for him He's distanced himself from his genitals, and he yep. has this issue with his penis because he doesn't know if he likes it, or doesn't know if he wants to have it. Yeah, because it's this worthless like <laughs> thing that he doesn't really use because he's a virgin. And I lost my virginity very, very late in life. And what I found myself, and I'm gay, and I knew I was gay, but I found myself really distanced from I, my sexuality and my penis because I wasn't using it. And I kind of created David at a, it was a reflection of that, like an exaggerated version of that. But, uh, you know, when you're really shy, like I was, and, um, I can relate to that. Yeah. Right. Very much so, so you just, you have this body and you're not using it the way that you're a man and you're supposed to be doing this. And especially in the gay community, there's all of the, it's like everybody picks everybody up and there's all this <laughs> grinder and there's all this stuff. But if you don't do that, you kind of feel completely distanced from your community because that's what re is reflected back at you. And with David, he's so uncomfortable with his sexuality and can't face it, therefore he can't even face his penis. And in an earlier draft of the script, he really wanted to cut it off and 
that be it. And he wasn't precious about it. He didn't want to become a female. He just didn't want to have a penis anymore. Totally. Because he was this, this worthless thing that was just a vessel for his urine. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> um, anyway, that's where that came from. And in terms of the other characters, um, I wanted to create teenagers that could actually exist. And I was influenced by uh, films like Welcome to the Dollhouse, even though mm-hmm. I was a little oh, younger. Yeah, yeah. An election that are funny and they're dark, but they're, they seem based out of this real awkward. I mean, li- very... life life is messy, and that's sort of one of those things that, like yeah. in America, we sort of um, make everything so bland in a lot of ways. That's like we have cliches like, "Oh, he's the jock," or "He's the athlete," or "He's the nerd," and it's like anything can't exist outside of that context. Yeah. So to actually see sort of like an honest treatment of like, oh, this guy's a bully and this, this, but he's also like, you know, got these elements of like, he's, he's smart about cars or he like, it's not just a one dimensional sort right. of perspective of people. And I do get really tired of that, that Disney teen, everybody's really like perfect and good looking, but they fill in, they fit into these boring roles of mean cheerleader, blonde and, well, th- that's one of the interesting things that, as you talk about, that makes me think: Is this was this experience in terms of making this film sort of therapeutic in the sense that, like, when I hear you talk about it, there's some elements that you know come from growing up. You know, like your fear of aging out as a, an actor, as a kid actor, and then there's an element of you that's like talking to these youths. Is this, in some ways, a dialogue? from your adult self to your younger self and sort of like trying to understand and accept all these things that these challenges that have come up in life for sure totally and it's like every teen character is me as a teenager and i here i am as a 30 something giving these kids advice but i'm just giving myself advice and i actually think that i would have been a good high school guidance counselor even though you know i don't do the good things in the movie but well one of the interesting things uh, that the film does touch upon, I guess it's not really a primary issue, is sort of like the way we relate, or he relates to the teenagers in it, in terms of like he drinks with them, there's some smoking with them. Uh, he, he he goes a little over the top with one towards the end, which I won't give away, just because it's, it's a really interesting spinoff that I, I did not see that direction coming. Yeah. Um, but what are your sort of perspectives of that? I mean, do you think there is a need to actually try and relate to teenagers on a level like that? Do you think that there's too much, um, I guess it would be sort of like talking at teenagers as opposed to listening to them. What do you, what do you think the, after going through this as both, uh, you're growing up in, uh, an environment where you're sort of dealing with issues of aging. Um, I guess everyone does, so it doesn't really matter. But, um, I mean, did, did, is your experience growing up in Canada, did that have any influence? Because in, in America, like, we're so rigid in terms of, like, you know, get your driver's license at 16, oh, get your, your, your drinking at 20, what, when, you oh, we're 19, though, we yeah. at least have that. So it's, like, we're, we're very rigid, like, that was always one of the things I found funny, is that, like, you know, I could get a gun at, like, what, I mean, New Mexico, it's probably, like, 16, honestly, but, like, these rigid barriers that we've set up, Whereas life is such a fluid and complex thing, do you think that there are better ways, perhaps, to speak? Oh, with the for youth? sure. I, th- I think that um, kids, teenagers, feel all of them feel misunderstood, and I think that in my experience in high school with guidance counselors, they don't really listen to you because they have their mandate. This person needs to go to university. This neat person needs to graduate high school. And they're not actually listening to your problems. They just want to set you up for the straight and narrow and do the right thing. And, you know, like you said, get your driver's license at 16 and then go to university and then get a regular job. And, I mean, it's it's one of those, those things. I mean, you talk about uh, losing your virginia at an older age. Like, even that stuff, it's like, well, most people lose their virginia at, like, 15 or 16. And so there are these inscribe societal sure. rules even beyond the ones that are like legal binding things yeah so it's complex and because i always felt like an outsider even in high school and even now i kind of feel like those are the people who should be giving teenagers advice rather than people who fit in because every teenager i think inherently does feels like they don't fit in and if you're getting advice from somebody who doesn't fit in as well they're gonna i feel like they're gonna set you on the right path for you being a weirdo 
and I was a weirdo in high school and people would try to put me this way, but I always resisted it and wanted to go this way. And I wasted a lot of time trying to go this way, but I had, I had somebody, an authority figure or a friend who was like, nah, you need to go this way. I would have not wasted so much time. Yeah. Uh, in terms of making this film, obviously you wore so many different hats. Is there any sort of particular aspect that you find the most fulfilling or interesting? I mean, obviously writing's a, a complex thing, directing's a complex thing. I, I don't even want to approach acting. Like, I don't want to be in front of the camera as much as possible. So are there any aspects of this that you really found most fulfilling, or do you just, you just like all the different dimensions? Does it fill different aspects of you to do the different uh, tasks? I don't know. Well, the thing is, I've always thought I had the brain of a writer, and I always have um, enjoyed that when it's going well, and when it doesn't, you want to kill yourself. But on set, I love it. It's like a party, and it's a lot of fun. It's really great to see your script come alive, and going off script and fucking with it on the day. <laughs> I love that, and just seeing what other actors bring and what the, and how they can make it better, and just that's the really exciting. That's the part that I feel like I'm growing more and more passionate about. Um, the edit is funny. A friend of mine said that shooting on set is the party, and the edit is the cleanup before the parents come home, which is the perfect <laughs> way. It's yeah. not enjoyable. You're trying to make something that you thought was really working work, and it just takes so much time. And um, especially with this film, where we were balancing a certain comedic tone with something more dramatic and a lot, a lot of the improv. It was a real challenge, but my editor, Brian Atkinson, was really great and patient and was able to collaborate with me. That's a great point. I've always sort of, I don't know, really remember who instilled this concept into me, that there are sort of three phases of storytelling in a movie. There's the, the script that you write. You know, you have one vision of it when you put it on the page. You get to set. You know, there are realities of actors and settings and conditions that change that mm -hmm. from what you had in your head and then ultimately as you said you get all that you've improved perhaps all these different scenes or you take all these different angles and shots and you have to carve that together into what is the final product in the editing um how did that whole process evolve like your original vision oh, when yeah. you first started writing the script is it pretty much how you had imagined it or has it morphed into something that perhaps you, you might like better than what you had imagined or it's different, something completely different from what you had imagined in your head. It is really different. I think me being in it makes it a bit different. Um, but the thing that was interesting about this is um, I initially was going to just do this with friends and a video camera, like with your camera. And we were going to do it really punk rock and gritty and just get something done. Because I was getting really frustrated. I hadn't done a short in a long time, and I just wanted to do a feature. And I wanted to do it regardless of quality. But Telefilm Canada, uh, a man named Dan Lyons specifically, really liked the script. And they were able to finance us. Not a lot of money. Um, and so that actually raised the bar. And our cinematographer, Daniel Grant, actually made it look cinematic. Yeah, it looks very good. Yeah, so I was like... This thing that I thought was going to look like a home movie from 1985 <laughs> ends up looking a bit more like cinema, which is amazing. But the thing that I, I approached this film with was I couldn't be precious about anything. You have an idea of where the film is going to be set or what actor is going to be like. With a budget this low, you're never going to get everything that's in your head. So you have to go with the flow. You have to be a blade of the grass and the wind. You have to say no and yes, but you have to still have to direct it. But if you're in a location that doesn't look like the classroom setting that you had in your head and that's what you have, you can't raise a stink. <laughs> well, it's also you tough. Like, you it. talk about editing for comedic timing and balancing the drama and the comedy and stuff like that. Then you take all that other footage. And there's some stuff that I'm sure you're in your head. You're like, oh, this is, this is going to be a crazy funny laugh right here. And you're just like, wow, that did not work at all how I had imagined sure. in my head. Totally. That was a constant. Um, <laughs> or things that were... We're supposed to be more dramatic. We're coming off as comedic, and pe things that were comedic were like not <laughs> jiving. So we did a lot of finessing, and we did endless screenings while we were cutting it, just to cool. make sure people were liking it. And I actually recorded. I wasn't in the screening rooms, but I would record them to hear when people you're were just laughing. like sync it up with the movie, and you're just yeah, like, oh, exactly. here's a laugh, here's the beat. Oh, that's exactly. interesting. So that was really helpful. So the film is Guidance. It premiered at TIFF. You said uh, last year. Uh, it's playing here at SIF, 2015 SIF. Um, 
is there a website or anything that people can find out about its future destination? Or do you know where the future is going with it at well, this point? Well, we, we did sell it um, to the U.S. and Canada, so it's going okay, to be great. relast, released, relast. Sorry, I've been start up since a new word. Forty-five like in the morning. Um, it's going to be released, I think, in August oh, great. Um, this year, like in a couple of months. Um, in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, Strand Releasing is releasing in the U.S., and Search Engine Films is releasing it in Canada. Cool. We have a website, guidancethefilm.com, and our Facebook is Facebook slash Guidance the Film. So, right. and everything is pretty much being posted everywhere. Uh, and in terms of you personally, do you have any other projects? I mean, you talked about that the other film you were writing prior to starting this one. Do you have anything else you, you want people to keep your eyes out for for you? Or do you have a personal Twitter or something that people can keep tabs as to what you have going on? I have a Twitter. I'm at Pat Mills. And my next film is called Don't Talk to Irene. It's a teen... The one you actually starred, right? Yes. <laughs> First voice. It's a teen dance movie. It's like an outcast teen dance movie set in a retirement home. Very cool. And uh, we're hoping to shoot that in the fall. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Pat. I wish you the best of luck with this and uh, look forward to the next film. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to bite the side style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.